Here we are at chapter 10, disinfection. This is really the main thing that we want to do in drinking water treatment. It's removing pathogens. We're trying to keep ourselves safe. And in a third world context, disinfection is sometimes the only thing that we do. In this case, these bottles are being exposed to sunlight so that it can remove pathogens. Here's another example of disinfection, but this is a first world context, an ultraviolet radiation disinfection chamber. Our topic today is going to cover water disease and disinfection, like what it is that we want to remove. We're, we'll talk about some regulations, the properties. The CT concept is kind of how we do our design, our engineering design. And uh, of course, system, system design is a little bit um, building on that CT concept. When we look at the number of typhoid cases per 100,000 population over many decades, we see that there were a lot of typhoid cases back in the day. And then around 1910, 1915, right in here, we started doing things like chlorination. And typhoid dropped off dramatically. This has really been one of the major advances in human society, is taking pathogens out of our water. Typhoid is just one example of a pathogen that we've uh, taken out. Cholera is one of the types of uh, pathogens that we worry about, that we worried a lot more about back in the day. Cholera, cholera was endemic in England in um, 1853 or so. 1854, an important event happened. John Snow requested that they remove a handle from a particular pump, the Broad Street Pump, and it's and the spread of cholera stopped. Um, not too many people believed that it was the water, or he hadn't quite convinced everyone that it was the water, but this was an important development. And then in 1869, Coke discovers Vibrio cholera, the actual organism, and is able to isolate it from people who had died from cholera. So they began to tie these organisms to these diseases. And then in 1874, Louis Pasteur publishes his Discourse on Human Infections and Pasteurization. John Snow was able to figure out where that pump was using some mapping. So it's kind of cool. Nowadays, we would do this with software tools. Back in the day, he used pencil and paper. And on the map, you can see these little bars. It's essentially a bar graph posted on a map, and this bar is showing a really high number. These are cholera cases, and he started pinning down that, um, sure enough, people were having higher cholera cases around this one area, around this particular pump, the Broad Street pump. You can see Broad Street labeled on the map. And you see some of these other ones further away. Well, there's pumps over here and pumps over here, and the cholera cases are not so near uh, or not happening near, next to those pumps. Um, but here's a cholera case, and I don't know if it was this particular one, but someone that Jon Snow interviewed that was far away from the Broad Street pump said that they were actually using, they had contracted cholera, and they were actually using the Broad Street pump. And that was one of the things that convinced him that, aha, he had found the reason for the cholera cases, and so he asked them to remove the the uh, handle from the pump. You can read through some of these other examples here of giving you a historical context. But the main point is that a lot of the treatment technologies that we have today really started with disinfection. Or rather, people were trying to remove pathogens from water. And that's the reason we do water treatment now. And here are a few of those pathogens that we care about. Bacteria, viruses, protozoa, amoebic cysts. Um, e. coli and cholera fall under the bacteria category. And here's a nice scanning electron microscope image of those. Those are relatively large uh, materials, fairly easy to rem remove in terms of size, um, especially compared to something like a rotavirus or a denovirus. These are quite small. Viruses are some of the smallest and most difficult things to remove. Plus, viruses have this capsid, this sort of hard shell around them that makes them difficult to treat. Um, and then we have things like cryptosporidium oocysts. 
And when I said a virus had a hard shell, well, a Cryptosporidium oozus has a very hard shell. And even though this is actually a larger organism, much larger than a virus, even though they're next to each other, this Cryptosporidium is, is quite large, even compared to bacterium. Um, these are some of the most difficult things to treat if they are in the water, they're, or rather they're difficult to treat chemically if they are in the water because of that hard shell. And we'll talk some about that toward the end of the lecture. Giardia is another example of something that causes humans harm and that we want to remove. This is an excellent example of a slide with too many words on it. But the point here is that society has morphed. Not only did we want to remove our pathogens, but now we have regulations stipulating how we remove those pathogens. Or really, it's all about knowing what is difficult to remove and writing regu regulations so that people are ensured that those pathogens will be removed. So Giardia lamblia, viruses, Legionella are some good examples. We have to inactivate 99.9% .9 of Giardia and 99.99% .99 of viruses. And if you remember back to our discussion of log removal, this would be three log removal of Giardia and four log removal of viruses. That's the way the regulations are written. An example of those regulations, the Stage 1 disinfecti Disinfectants and Disinfection Byproducts Rule from 1998. We've got maximum con contaminant levels for trihalomethanes, haloacetic acids, bromate, and chloride. Well, what is this talking about? Not only do we have to worry about removing the organisms or killing the organisms, but we have to worry about putting too much disinfectant in our water and causing disinfection byproducts. So all of these things, trihalomethanes, haloacetic acids, etc., those are disinfection byproducts that could cause us harm. Um, chlorine itself could cause us harm if we, we, if we put too much of it in the water. Chloramines are another type of disinfectant, but again, we don't want too much, and even chlorine dioxide is a third that we don't want too much of in our water. Um, Interim enhanced surface water treatment rule is another iteration. A lot of these regulations have been revised and updated over the years, and this one is an example. Stage two disinfectant and disinfection byproducts rule from 2002 is a further update from stage one. And then we have long term two enhanced surface water treatment rule. And the interesting thing here is that these regulations do continue to evolve, and the EPA is still and will continue to be looking at new regulations or adjustments to regulations as we go. Now if we were in class, I would stop here and I would blink the screen and I would have you not look at this. So just close your eyes for a minute and ask yourself, if you're gonna put a disinfectant into the water, a chemical type disinfectant, or maybe, maybe it's not a chemical type disinfectant, what are the properties that you want? Well, it has to be able to, to kill whatever it is you're trying to kill, obviously. But it has to do it in a practical time period. It has to be quick and in a cost-effective dosage. So it has to be cheap. And here it is down here, cost-effective again, reiterated. Obviously, it can't cost too much. Otherwise, um, it, won't, it won't work. It has to work at the temperature of water. And this is important in particular with cryptosporidium. We've seen outbreaks of cryptosporidium that were linked to the low temperatures, meaning that the disinfectants were not as effective at killing the cryptosporidium at those low temperatures. Um, what about differences in composition, pH, the conditions of the water? A perfect disinfectant will work in any water type. It can't be toxic to humans or domestic animals either, obviously. We don't want to kill pathogens only to kill the receivers of the water that we're trying to create. The palatable question is one that's interesting because we have in the United States sort of evolved a taste for chlorine, some people say at least. Um, some people would say in, in other parts of the world that the chlorine that we add is not palatable. They don't like the taste of the chlorine or perhaps you don't like the taste of chlorine in your water either. Um, but I guess it's palatable enough that we still use it these days. 
It's got to be safe and easy to store, transport, handle, and apply. Arguably, gaseous chlorine doesn't meet this mark um, well enough for a lot of people. Uh, there are a lot of safety considerations with chlorine gas, but we've done a lot to, to make it safer, and it is still in use in a lot of places. And then we have to be, be able to determine the concentration easily and inexpensively just so that we know how much dose we're adding and it has to provide a residual in the drinking water treatment system or in the distribution system. Now again, in Europe, they don't provide residuals in their water system. So this is sort of a US centric type of goal. We'll take a little foray into wastewater treatment here to talk about how those disinfectants in a wastewater treatment context or what those properties need to be. Uh, they still need to kill pathogens. We still don't want to produce carcinogenic compounds to release to a water body. So these are the disinfection byproducts that, that we're talking about. But in this case, it needs to be non-toxic to fish, or if it is toxic, we have to be able to remove it. And chlorine, again, is an example of this. We can dechlorinate by adding different chemicals to the water to take out the chlorine. Or, in a lot of cases, wastewater treatment has moved toward ultraviolet disinfection because ultraviolet is just light, and when you turn the light off, there is no residual and that is one advantage. We can apply disinfectants in three different ways. We've got gases, liquids, and solids. And here we would call all of these chlorine. Chlorine gas, sodium hypochlorite is the liquid form. This is essentially just bleach. And calcium hypochlorite is the solid, maybe like you're putting in a pool, your pool tablet. Here's some old pictures of gaseous chlorine tanks and we can replace that with pictures of the chlorine mixers and how you would apply these things to the water itself. Disinfection is one of the places in water treatment where chemistry is really important. Chlorine gas, for example, dissolves quickly or yeah, dissolves quickly into water when it's exposed and then it reacts quickly with water to dissociate into a hypochlorous ion and uh, an H plus and a Cl minus. So we get this chloride ion coming off, but the HOCl is the thing that really does the disinfection. The H plus is important. We'll see in the next slide that pH is uh, very important to chlorine chemistry. Um, HOCl further dissociates to H plus and OCl minus, and HOCl is more powerful than OCL minus for E. coli. Um, so we'll talk about that in the next slide as well. But I wanna point out this definition, free available chlorine. This is an important vocabulary word that everyone in the water treatment industry should know. We define free available chlorine as the concentration of HOCl plus the concentration of OCL minus plus the concentration of dissolved Cl2 aqueous. Now, most of the time, we don't really have very much aqueous CO, uh, chlorine gas because it does dissolve so quickly into hypochlorite and hypochlorous ions, but this is the official free available chlorine definition. The pH dependency that we talked about in the last slide is shown graphically here, and this is actually a really great example of why you took Chem 1 or Chem 2, wherever you talked about acid base chemistry. We can see here the pH where these two things balance out and are the same concentration is right around 7.54. Actually, I know that because it's written right here. So the pKa is 7.54. Again, a reminder pKa means the concentration of the hypochlorous acid ion and the hypochlorite ion. Um, are equal, or actually this is hypochlorous acid, it's not an ion, my apologies, this one is an ion. And those are equal at the pKa of 7.54. So higher pH gives you more hypochlorite ion, and lower pH gives you more hypochlorous acid. What pH do we want to operate our disinfection at then? 
We like it when it's a lower pH because the hypochlorous acid is more effective as a disinfectant than the hypochlorite ion. Now we arrive at example problem 10-1 from the back of the chapter. What is the pH of water at 25 degrees Celsius with 0.5 milligram per liter of hypochlorous acid in it? And a few key points, we're going to assume equilibrium has been achieved and then neglect the dissociation of water. And then this is just talking about significant figures. Let's jump over to the write-up of it. I've written out the temperature and the initial concentration or the initial amount that we add to the water of hypochlorous acid. And we want to find the pH. And we're neglecting the dissociation of water as mentioned. In appendix A5 in your book, you can find the pKa for HOCl, or you can see the slides that we just talked about. 7.54 is the pKa, and the Ka is 10 to the negative pKa, so we get Ka 10 to the negative 7.54. First, let's go ahead and convert these milligram per liter units to mole per liter units. So 0.5 milligrams per liter of our hypochlorous acid um, that has 52.5 milligrams for every millimole, and I'll just point out that it's one gram per liter, one milligram per millimole for hydrogen, 16 for oxygen, and 35.5 for chlorine. You might as well just get in your head now that the molecular weight of a chlorine atom is 35.5. We will be using it a lot. And then we do a unit conversion from millimole to mole, and we get this number moles per liter of our HOCl. And then we turn to our chemistry. This is the definition of Ka, the product of the reactants divided by the product, uh, I'm sorry, the, <laughs> the product of the products divided by the product of the reactants. So hearkening back to Chem 1 again, and then here is where our ignoring the dissociation of water comes into play because we know that water itself will dissociate to give you some hydrogen ions, but we are assuming that we're putting this chemical in the water and so most of the hydrogen ions that exist in the water are gonna be from that chemical so we don't have to worry about the hydrogen ions that came natively from the water. And then if the hydrogen ions came from the chemical, the only place we got negatively charged material was also from that chemical so H plus equals OCl minus and then we can rewrite our equi equilibrium expression to just have H plus as our unknown and solve for that here plug in the numbers and we get the H plus is 5.24 times 10 to the negative seventh the pH is the negative log of that and we get 6.28 for our final answer and that is lower than seven. That's what we would expect. We're adding hypochlorous acid to water, so it should drop it a little bit, but we haven't added very much, only 0.5 milligrams per liter, so we've only dropped the pH by a little bit. Previously, we alluded to other forms of chlorine. Here, we're gonna dive in a little bit further. We've got sodium hypochlorite is a hypochlorite salt, calcium hypochlorite, another hypochlorite salt, and let's compare it to chlorine gas, for example. Gas is still cheaper. This is actually a byproduct of some other chemical processing that is done out there in the industrial world. So chlorine gas is pretty cheap. Um, it does decrease the pH when you put it into water because of those reactions that we already looked at, and the dissociation into H plus and Cl minus and the hypochlorite ion. Um, and so that reduces your alkalinity, so that's something to consider. Hypochlorite salts, on the other hand, they're more expensive, but they're safer. Why are they safer? Because a liquid form salt, or uh, I guess you could get it solid, but most of the time we buy these things in, dissolved in water in a liquid form, they're easier to contain than a gaseous form of chlorine. So that's, uh, that's why they're safer. And they always contain alkali to enhance the st stability, but even if they didn't, they would in tend to increase the pH of your water. And um, they have varying oxidizing power. 
And so in the industry, we've come up with a term called percent available chlorine. And this is, it's not really a chemistry definition necessarily. It's more of a, a practical use type definition. We compare everything to the equivalent weight of chlorine. We know some compound and we've got its equivalent weight and we compare that to the equivalent weight of chlorine. So we'll dive into that in a minute. Here's where we're diving into this percent available chlorine concept. We want to estimate the percent available chlorine in chlorinated lime, calcium, well it's CaOCl2. Note this is not the hypochlorite ion, but it's chlorinated lime, which is a little bit different. Um, just to point out real quick before we dive into that particular problem, we've got all these other types of materials that could be disinfectants or they're at least at minimum these are oxidizers. So uh, ClO2 is um, an oxidizer, for example, that we might use in, um, in disinfection. That is chlorine dioxide. H2O2, we had a, a water joke about H2O2, but that's peroxide. It's a pretty good oxidizer as well. And so we've got all these different things and we ask ourselves, how do they compare to chlorine? Well, we can see the number of electrons that they spit out. And that's great. Uh, in fact, number of electrons is kind of the e equal way to compare these things to each other. For example, HOCl gives off two electrons and chlorine gas gives off two electrons. So we say that the HOCl and the chlorine gas are equivalent in that way. But what we're talking about with percent available chlorine is compared to the mass of these compounds. So let's look at the solution here. Again, estimate the percent available chlorine in chlorinated lime. And here's the definition of percent available chlorine that we had previously. This is the oxidizing power of the material. From that table that we just looked at, we have this half reaction that chlorine gas gives two electrons and or, or yeah you add two electrons it receives two electrons to form cl minus and to use up the oxidizing power of that chlorine so the equivalent weight of chlorine gas is found by looking at the gram molecular weight of cl2 told you in a previous slide that 35.5 is a number we should remember 2 times 35.5 is the molecular weight of the chlorine gas molecule. And we know that we get two, equivalent, uh, two equivalents for every mole of chlorine gas. So we divide those by each other and we get 35.5 grams of chlorine gas per equivalent. So now we ask ourselves, what about the chlorinated lime? Well, from that same table, we see the chlorinated lime <clears throat> gives us two electrons, or rather, we have to add two electrons <coughs> for the chlorinated lime, same as chlorine gas, except that the equivalent weight of chlorinated lime is 127 grams per mole. So when we divide those out, we see that it's 63.5 grams per equivalent. Or in other words, if I want two electrons, or if I want one electron, if I want one equivalent, I would have to add 35.5 grams of chlorine gas. But if I want that same equivalent, if I want that same electron worth of oxidizing power, I have to add 63.5 grams of chlorinated lime. So the percent available chlorine is just comparing those two together. 35.5 compared to 63.5 and then we multiply times 100 to give us 55.9 percent. In other words, on a mass basis, the chlorinated lime is only 55.9% as powerful as chlorine gas itself. And why is that? Well, the calcium that's in there is really not doing anything. It's just adding mass to the system. And so that's why it's uh, percent available chlorine is less than, than chlorine gas. <clears throat> Look also at examples 10.2 in the book. And then here's a, a really important conceptual question. How is it possible for there to be greater than 
available chlorine? Or is it possible to have greater than 100% available chlorine? And yes, it is possible. It's possible any time the molecular weight of the compound or the equivalent weight of the compound is less than the equivalent weight of chlorine. So do you see what would happen if um, the equivalent weight of the compound were less than 35.5? We would get a number larger than 100%. And this does not violate any rules of physics or thermodynamics. It's just that the definition of percent available chlorine is <clears throat> that we're comparing it to chlorine gas. If something is more powerful than chlorine gas on a mass basis, then it will have greater than 100% available chlorine. So we've talked a little bit about chlorine chemistry, <clears throat> but how do these things actually work? What do they do? The simple way to think about it is they break bonds. They break bonds inside the bacteria or the organism that we're trying to disinfect. So a bacterial membrane, for example, will be disrupted by the chlorine. Enzymes can be denatured. Enzymes are proteins. Proteins require, or enzymes require, a very specific structure for that protein. And when you break a bond inside that structure, you deactivate that enzyme. It can also denature nucleic acid. And as you know, DNA is required for cell replication. And here's an example where you might not kill the organism itself, but if you can prevent it from replicating by disrupting the nucleic acid, then you've done a, a good job there too. We can also alter the permeability of bacterial cells, and that means they can't maintain the proper weight of water inside the cell, and then they die that way. And then all these things can happen to things that are not bacteria, but viruses, protozoa, especially cryptosporidium, I mentioned previously, these are resistant. And why are they resistant? Because they have these layers of material that prevent the chlorine from getting in there. So you could do a lot of oxidation to the outside of the cryptosporidium, for example. But if it doesn't reach the inner core, then you haven't disinfected the material. Now you've been hearing a lot about chlorine. We're going to sh switch gears a little bit to chloramines, which, you know, it's still chlorine, I guess, but it's quite a bit different because the chlorine gas in this case reacts with ammonia, with NH4 plus is the form of ammonia, usually in water. What are formed are NH2Cl, NHCl, and NCl3. The first thing that's formed is this uh, NH2Cl. We call that monochloramine because there's one chlorine atom in this uh, molecule. Dichloramine is when you have two chlorine atoms, and trichloramine is three chlorine atoms. And I think it's instructive to think about structures in this case. If you liked organic chemistry, maybe you talked a lot about structures. Here is ammonia, NH3, and it's sort of this, I guess it's not a planar molecule because you have a lone pair of electrons hanging out here. But we can think of it just in this triangle shape. And if we take off a hydrogen and we add a chlorine, then we have monochloramine. Take off another one and add a second chlorine, and we've got dichloramine. Take off a third, and we've got trichloramine. That's all this really is. That's all chloramine really is. Chloramine does last longer in water than chlorine gas, or the hypochlorite ion and the hypochlorous acid that come from chlorine gas. And there are fewer disinfection byproducts than with chlorine. So that's why we like chloramines. Um, especially in really big distribution systems. So like up in Greenville, they have a really big distribution system and they've opted to use chloramine. So when we went to the Whitty Atkins treatment plant, we saw uh, we couldn't really see all the gas tanks uh, uh, that were adding things to the water, but we did talk about the fact that they're adding chloramines to the water by adding both chlorine and ammonia. And that's to give that really long residual in the large distribution system of the Greenville water um, system. The disadvantages though to chloramines are that they're slower acting. They're not as powerful. They aren't as effective as an oxidant 
as chlorine itself. And so we often use these in combination with other disinfectants, like we might add um, ozone, for example, first, and ozone has no residual, so we add the chloramine to give the residual after the ozone. And how does it operate? Disrupting enzyme functions largely similar to what chlorine did in the previous slide. Let's do an example problem where we discuss how to add the right amount of chlorine and ammonia to give us the monochloramine concentration that we want as a residual disinfectant. Two milligram per liter is a pretty typical residual disinfectant, 1700 meters cubed per day. Well, that just depends on the size of the plant. Let's jump over to the writing here. I've at the top, I have the pictures that I showed you a minute ago, the drawings of what chloramines are, monochloramine, dichloramine, etc., as a little review there. And um, here are the parameters, feed rate of chlorine and NH3 to achieve the residual that we want. And the flow rate was given here, but we're going to convert to meters cubed per minute for use later. And here's a little bit of chlorine or monochloramine uh, or chloramine chemistry. Ammonia plus one molecule of hypochlorous acid gives you monochloramine plus a water. If you take that monochloramine and you add another hypochlorous acid, you get dichloramine. And if you add a, to the dichloramine, you add another HOCl, you get trichloramine. Now trichloramine is pretty short-lived. It'll just revert back to dichloramine or react away pretty quickly. And then dichloramine, you don't have as much of that as you do monochloramine either. So it's sort of the monochloramine that, that we typically think about in a treatment context. So the mass of monochloramine required. We know we want two milligrams per liter, which is two grams per meter cubed. So we're gonna simply multiply times the flow rate. And we know we're gonna have to add 2.361 grams every minute to this system. So we look at our chemical equation and the monochloramine or the ammonia plus the hypochlorous acid gives us our monochloramine. And so that tells us that if I'm gonna add chlorine gas to the system, well, oh, okay, actually, here's another equation that we need. We need to know that when we add chlorine gas to water, we get one molecule of HOCl. And we come to this conclusion, one mole of, of chlorine gas reacts to form that one mole of HOCl. And we know that one mole of NH3 of ammonia reacts with one mole of the hypochlorous acid. And that forms one mole of monochloramine. So that means for every mole of monochloramine that we want, we need to add one mole of chlorine gas. Let's look at the gram molecular weight of NH2Cl. We add all these up. Oh, I forget what nitrogen is. Oh, 14, right? And then hydrogen is one and chlorine is 35.5. Add those up to get 51.5 grams per mole. And we can do sort of a little unit conversion here to see 2.361 grams per minute divided by the 51.5 grams per mole gives us 0.046 moles per minute. Thinking in chemistry mass terms now, moles per minute. So if we're gonna feed 0.046 moles per minute of both chlorine and NH3, because it's a one-to-one -one reaction, then the amount of chlorine that we need depends on its molecular weight. One chlorine atom is 35.5, so two is 70.9. I guess we could have said 80 maybe. But uh, then we also take the 17 gram per mole of ammonia. And for chlorine two, we just multiply that 0.046 moles per minute that we needed up there by its molecular weight and we get 3.3 grams per minute. And the ammonia is gonna be 0.78 grams per minute by the same token. Let's talk about another disinfectant then Chlorine dioxide, we still haven't gotten away from that chlorine atom, but now it's combined with two oxygens to give us the chlorine dioxide. This is something that's pretty reactive, so you can't really store it, you have to produce it on site. 
It is super soluble in water. It doesn't react with ammonia, which is an advantage if you have a water that does have ammonia in it. So maybe a uh, wastewater treatment context or just some place where you have high ammonia. It does provide a, some residual disinfectant, though not nearly as much of a disinfect a residual as chlorine or, or um, chloramine, but it is pretty potent. Um, so if you need something that works well, then chlorine dioxide could be your disinfectant. The big disadvantage to chlorine dioxide is this uh, chlorate and chloride that could be produced. Now those aren't, aren't gonna always be produced, but you need to monitor for them and, and make sure your conditions are such that you won't be producing those disinfection byproducts. And how does ClO2 work? Well, it denatures proteins in bacteria and viruses, and it does it even more effectively than chlorine because it breaks those bonds even more readily than chlorine does. Now let's go ahead and talk about something that does not have chlorine in its uh, atomic structure. This is ozone. Produced on site by electric discharge and widely used in Europe, ozone is a very powerful oxidant and that's why we like it a lot. It kills bacteria, kills viruses and cysts, and it doesn't have any taste or odor problems because it reacts very quickly. There is no residual for ozone. It goes away before you can get it out of the, get the water out of the plant. And it is more expensive than chlorine, mainly because of this um, infrastructure that you need, all this equipment like large stainless steel vats and, and uh, mixers and whatnot to produce your ozone. There can be bromate formation, which might be another disadvantage. But um, the key thing with ozone is that it works well if you can afford it. And in the United States, we are starting to see more ozone use. Like, for example, at the Anderson treatment plant, they're installing ozone. Their main goal is for taste and odor. They've got taste and odor coming into the plant, and the ozone can destroy that taste and odor. Um, but they're also going to get a lot of disinfection from that ozone as well. What are the things that affect how a disinfectant behaves? Well, the dose matters a lot, or the concentration matters a lot. And I'm going to take this opportunity to point out that it should not actually be dose edge. It should just be dose. A lot of people say dose edge when they really mean dose. Dosage means a dose over a time period. So I guess if you're talking about, yeah, maybe concentration per time. So every uh, a milligram per liter every hour, that is a dosage. But a dose is just a milligram per liter, single dose form. Um, now other people may have different opinions about those word uses, but I think dose and dosage should be distinguished from one another. Um, contact time is important. The higher the contact time, the higher the efficacy. Turbidity. The higher the turbidity, the worse your disinfection because, as you can imagine, you've got more material in there to use up your disinfectant. And if you're talking about uh, ultraviolet light, which we'll get to in a minute, turbidity is super important. If there's any other reactive species, if those are high, then that's going to decrease your disinfectant capability because you're going to be reacting away your disinfectant on all those other things instead of on the bacteria or the organisms. pH can affect efficacy. We saw that high pH leads to lower disinfection capability for chlorine, for example. And that's because high pH means less hydrogen ion, ions present and that means you're shifting the reaction toward hypochlorite and hypochlorite is less powerful than the hypochlorous acid um, but i use just a small arrow there because you still get a decent amount of disinfectant power even as ph increases and i'm only talking about chlorine in this case the others may be less uh, sensitive to ph it really depends on the particular chemistry of that disinfectant 
temperature is. Temperature goes up, disinfection capability goes up, and this is because reaction rates are higher. You're trying to react chlorine with those nucleic acids and those proteins and whatnot. So the higher the temperature, the faster that reaction and the less contact time you need to do your disinfection. Biology of the organism, we've already talked about this a little bit. Relative strength of disinfectant. Here we summarize kind of what we've looked at so far, the four that we've talked about. It should have been clear that ozone was the most powerful disinfectant. It's the, the most highly reactive disinfectant. Chlorine dioxide is less reactive than ozone, but better than free chlorine. Free chlorine is in the middle, I guess, and chloramines is down here at the bottom. But the curious thing about this is that chloramines had the highest residual concentration. Free chlorine had some residual, or a decent amount of residual, actually the Anderson drinking water system. They have a fairly large distribution system with water ages approaching two days, and they only use free chlorine and, and they still get the job done. So free chlorine does have a, a decent residual, even though chloramines is, has a larger residual. ClO2 has some residual, but it's smaller than chlorine, and ozone has no residual, so no arrow for ozone. And that should make sense too. The more reactive it is, the, the more powerful it is, the faster it goes away. And the less powerful it is, the longer it hangs out in your system. So there's a balance here, and maybe that's sort of the reason that we've sort of balanced around free chlorine over the years. And let's take a little side note to talk about disinfection byproducts or to summarize them for all of the disinfectants that we've talked about. Chlorine, chlorine dioxide, chloramines, and ozone. You see a lot of disinfection byproducts with chlorine, fewer with chlorine dioxide, fewer with chloramines, and only bromate with ozone. And in fact, you only get bromate when you have bromine in the system. And a lot of systems don't have very much bromine. So disinfection byproducts aren't a big problem with ozone. I will say though that these DBPs for chlorine, part of the reason we know we have a long list is because we have a long history of using chlorine and a lot of people have looked for the disinfection byproducts. Now, there could be other disinfection byproducts to worry about from the other things, but maybe we're just not looking for them. Um, and here's some chemical structures over here. On this side, this looks a lot like methane if it were carbon with four hydrogens in this geometry, it would have been methane, but we've replaced three of the hydrogens with chlorines, and so we have a trihalomethane. This is trichloromethane. Um, we could have put a bromine here or a fluorine, and those are also halogens, and those would have then been also trihalomethanes. Now we haven't lumped ultraviolet radiation in with the other disinfectants because it's sort of a different beast. It's not a chemical that we're adding, but it's rather light that we're applying to the water. It is pretty effective. Ultraviolet light at a wavelength of roughly 254 nanometers is a typical wavelength for ultraviolet radiation. There are no known byproducts because, again, we're just adding light that's sort of destroying things, and we're not adding new atoms to systems that can create new molecules like we do with chlorine. It's fairly effective against bacteria and viruses, with a big disadvantage being its inability to provide a residual, which becomes an advantage in wastewater treatment like we talked about. And then you have to have a pretty clear water, no turbidity, and your lamps need to be pretty clean. And actually over the years, some of the innovations with ultraviolet radiation have been in automated ways to clean the lamps to make sure that the system always gives a good dose of UV to the light. Now it is somewhat difficult to determine the administered dose but there's been a lot of work in this in recent years, and the manufacturers and the regulators have come to agreements, and they've done, they have testing protocols to make sure that a new UV module can apply a given dose, and so we're working on this disadvantage. And the mode of action, it's inducing mutations, damaging DNA. Really, it's still just breaking bonds, 
It's just doing it with light instead of with a chemical. When we think about disinfection, we need to think about how fast can we accomplish disinfection or how much contact time do we need to be able to remove all the microorganisms. And this is the subject of disinfection kinetics. So kinetics means speed, essentially, or the rate at which reactions happen. Chick came up with this law here, where we're talking about the number of microorganisms at some time t divided by the original number of microorganisms that you started with. You can figure that out if you know what the rate constant is for disinfection, and you know how long that these things have been reacting. Now Chick Watson, <clears throat> or Chick the same person and Watson collaborated to come up with a publication where they explained that this kill on the left side is related not just to K and T but to the concentration of disinfectant that you're adding as well. And this makes sense, I think it makes sense anyway, if you have a very high concentration then you could get, a, get away with a lower contact time and get the same kill over here as you would get if you had a higher contact time and a lower concentration. As long as those two, two things balance out, then you can get this same kill on the left-hand side with that same rate constant. The rate constant always remains the same. It's the concentration of disinfectant that we can change as well as the contact time. Of course, once your plant is built, it's hard to change your contact time. So after the plant is built, you're usually just changing the concentration to achieve the disinfection that you want. When we think about disinfection kinetics, we can look at the plots of how the, um, the survivors decay over time. So let's start with this line in the middle. The first order decay, this is what's plotted on the previous slide. So let's bounce back up to that. So this one right here, actually both of these would give a linear slope. So just a typical first order decay. Um, but multi-hit, what does that mean? Multi-hit is indicative of something like cryptosporidium. Cryptosporidium has a very thick shell. So it takes multiple hits and you don't get very rapid decay at the beginning. But after the disinfectant has been, or the uh, organism has been exposed to the disinfectant for a while, then the decay really starts to drop, and this is the multi-hit scenario. Um, the retardant scenario is a little bit different. This kind of indicates that you have some organisms that die quickly, and that's why you have this initial fast slope. And then you have some organisms that die slowly, and they last a lot longer, and so you have a less steep slope there. The other thing that can happen with a retardant situation is when your concentration of disinfectant is decreasing over time. So initially it was working well, but after the, the disinfectant itself decays and there's not as much left, then you're not getting as much removal later on. Here is what the contactors might look like at a real plant. And the key thing to note here is that we want a plug flow system. So when you want something with a long retention time, you want to have this plug flow system that gives it that long retention time without any short circuiting or, or mixing. We don't want a CSTR where this whole thing would be mixed together and then some of that initial water coming in would go very quickly out the end uh, in a CSTR situation. In a plug flow situation we make sure that it all has a long retention time. And so here's one example of a way to get a plug flow is serpentine channel. Here's another one. It's really a serpentine channel too with this wall. You know the water's going around that wall. Um, here's another one and here they've taken a round basin and turned it into a serpentine or a plug flow basin by putting these walls in it so that it um, goes around like a plug flow. The circular edges or corners are to help the flow, uh, again, be more plug flow because you don't get mixing um, as much as you do in a square corner. 
And this link right here takes us to a plant in Scottsdale, Arizona. And uh, I had this link on here because I was familiar with this plant from my postdoc days at Arizona State University. You should notice quickly that this is a wastewater treatment plant. Like you have these, well, actually, these look like anaerobic digesters, but they're really not. It's just that this Scottsdale area is pretty ritzy and they covered up all of their tanks to avoid odors. But over here is the part that I was uh, pointing to, and it's a disinfection system where you have long channels. And this part is covered. It used to not be covered, so it was a little better example uh, before they covered it. But you have this water going up and down and back and around, and that is typical of a plug flow sort of disinfection system, in this case for wastewater. We've already said that contactors need to be an ideal plug flow type of contactor. What does that mean? Well, the length to width ratio should be something like 40 to 1 or greater than 40 to 1. The height to which width ratio should be something like 1 to 3. And this using T10 to account for non-ideal plug flow pattern, we'll talk about it in the next slide, but let's take a look over here. Figure 10.1 talks about different baffling condition examples. So all of this is A, and all of this is B, and all of this is C. And at the top, we have a poor baffling situation because we can see all of these dead zones in here. And it even is showing sort of some recirculation happening right here. Dead zones here, dead zones here. Dead zones here over in the section view too. Poor baffling. When we add a few baffles in, we get a little bit better, an average baffling, where you have some baffles here, and then it's going under this wall and over this wall. But maybe we still have some dead zones here that we can see in the section view. Maybe some dead zones here in that other section view of the circular part or a circular type um, tank. And down at the bottom, we have much better baffling where where the water has to go through these holes or these uh, openings inside the walls and so you don't really see any dead zones maybe a little dead zone right here at the end maybe some little dead zones in the circular section down here but with those baffles we don't have dead zones forming now arguably we do have mixing still occurring and so that's why most of our disinfection chambers are just the long serpentine channels that we saw in the previous slide. Okay, when we talk about disinfectant ability, we're talking about CT. If you have a lot of concentration of disinfectant, or you have a lot of contact time, then you have a high CT, and that gives you really good log reduction in the number of Giardian viruses, specifically is what we care about or sometimes those are the limiting things. Sometimes cryptosporidium is also limiting. But the key here is that it's actually T10, the contact time. And what does T10 mean? Well, I think I can sort of draw it out a little bit. Let's imagine we have a contactor that is just a once through type contactor flowing from uh, left to right. Let's imagine at the beginning I put in one, two, three, four, Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's my ninth. Organisms. Well, as they flow through, if it were a perfect plug flow contactor, they would all stay, like as they travel from left to right, they would all stay in a perfect line. But we know that they're not perfect, and so some of these guys are going to spread out a little bit. Did I get ten there? Well, even if I didn't get ten, let me try ten over here. One, two three, four, five, six, seven, nine, ten, they're spreading out, you see that? And you would imagine that just because you have diffusion and dispersion happening as the flow moves from left to right. As it gets further and further down the contactor, they're spreading out more, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, I guess I didn't spread them out enough right there. But right at the very end, let's draw them like this, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. 
where this last guy right here has actually left the contactor. So now I'm just drawing the end of the contactor, essentially. That one organism left the contactor, even though the middle line of these organisms have, haven't left. The median number of organisms hasn't left yet. Because that one left, one sort of left a little early, the T10 is actually a little earlier than the theoretical contact time. And the only way to know T10, let's go back up here, the only way to know that T10 is to determine it using a tracer study. You assume plug flow, yes, but you do a tracer study to see just how much concentration leaves the system sort of before you expect. And it's the time required for 10% of that tracer to pass through the contactor, just like 10% of those organisms. One organism out of the 10 left a little bit early, and that's the time we care about. Why is it that way? Oh, I lost my uh, drawings there. But it's that way because we don't want to accidentally allow some organisms to leave the system and not receive their full dose of disinfectant. Um, often, this contact time could be less than 65% of the hydraulic detention time. So hydraulic detention time, again, is V over Q, the volume divided by the flow rate. But uh, a lot of times you do have some mixing or some dead zones, and so the time is much shorter than the actual hydraulic or the theoretical hydraulic retention time. And CT can be described using this equation where pH to the sum power and temperature to the sum power affect the ability of your concentration and your time to do their work. We're not going to use this equation, but this is uh, something that you might find in the literature or in the regulations for CT. Chlorine demand is an important concept because <clears throat> when you put chlorine in water, some of it gets used up quite quickly. And this is especially true when you have ammonia nitrogen presence or ammonia present in the system. Now, some waters will naturally have ammonia, and sometimes we're adding ammonia to form chloramines. But if you notice right here, this curve is the chlorine applied curve. And this is the dose down here, or dosage is what they say. Um, then we're asking ourselves, how much residual chlorine do we get? Well, when you first start adding chlorine, you do get some residual. But if you have this ammonia present, like a mole ratio of one with ammonia, then that ammonia starts eating up the chlorine and the residual goes down, or rather, when you first start adding it, it combines with the ammonia present and forms monochloramine. And then as you're increasing the chlorine dose, though the chlorine dose that you're adding starts reacting with that monochloramine, and you end up degrading what you had, and the residual chlorine actually decreases until we reach this break point. And in this case, it's like 7.7 .7, uh, milligram per liter of chlorine. And then above this, you're essentially reacting away all your um, ammonia and you start to get free residual pre uh, predominating later on. Uh, the key concept here is that you're eating up some of your chlorine at this low concentration when you have ammonia present. Now the previous slides show the case of chlorine demand for ammonia, which has some interesting reactions. But sometimes you have fast demand reactions where an immediate demand is observed. In other words, we, even though we apply something like one milligram per liter of chlorine, well that one milligram per liter of chlorine got used up immediately, so the actual measured chlorine is zero in that case. So we add up to two milligrams, Chlorine, like here is, let's, let's imagine that's a two milligram per liter chlorine. Well, because you reacted away that immediate demand, you're down to this one milligram per liter of chlorine here. And this is very common when you first add chlorine to water. Some of it gets used up, 
but as you continue adding it, it moves up at a linear in a linear way. You just keep adding more dose. Yeah, notes note that they talk about sulfur dioxide as an example of something that would have this fast immediate demand. There's lots of other things that would react with chlorine as well. We just talked about chlorine reacting away very quickly at the beginning, but chlorine will also react away over longer time scales, and we call that chlorine decay. Essentially, after you add it and the concentration decreases quickly, it's going to also decrease over time. And this is happening just because of reactions with the walls of pipes, long-term reactions with other organic matter that's in the solution, and maybe even chlorine reacting with itself to some degree, maybe temperature effects. Um, chlorine is a reactive substance, and just like any reactive chemical, it can, it probably will react away over time. All right, time for an example problem. Problem 10-8 ten, <clears throat> in your book. Um, based on the hydraulic analysis, the town of Longview has determined that the water takes a long time to get to its customers. 26 hours to be exact, or to be an estimate, maybe. We've seen in a laboratory study that the decay of chlorine yields these results down below. So, what dose of chlorine is required to give us a residual of 0.5 milligrams per liter at the most distant customer's tap? In other words, after this 26 hours. Um, it says use a spreadsheet program to determine the decay constant. Well, actually what we need to do first is a little bit of calculus. Uh, for problem 10-8, we're gonna start with equation 10-17, which is one of the simplest differential equations there is, but it's also one of the most useful differential equations and one that you need to know. In fact, this is the same differential equation that we just saw for kill in a chlorine, like disinfection, the Chick-Watson law is the same form, first order uh, decay. But in this case, it's first order decay of the chlorine concentration. So C is the chlorine concentration here. All right, so dc dt equals negative kdc. We separate by bringing that C down over here, whoops, over here, and we separate by putting the dt over here, and then we integrate it integral of 1 over c dc is the natural log of c integral of dt is just t kd is a constant so we're able to pull that to the left of the integration sign and never forget your integration constant when you're doing these uh, separation and integration type problems uh, to get rid of the natural log of c we take the exponent of the natural log of c and that's of course c and then on this side, it's the exponent of both of those terms together. And e to the something plus something equals e to the, some, to the one thing times e to the other thing. And e to the constant is just a constant. So that's what ends up right here. Constant e to the negative kdt. Now we plug in our boundary conditions. And this is the thing that students always get a little confused about, like... The constant, you cannot automatically just say that C naught is the constant. You have to plug in the boundary conditions because when things get more complex, you can't just jump straight to C naught being that constant. So we have to say that at T equals zero, C equals C naught. Plug that in. So for this C, is we're plugging in the C naught. And then the constant just falls down here. E to the negative KD times that T of zero hours and now we can say that c naught equals the constant therefore the constant equals c naught and now i can plug it in c equals c naught e to the negative k dt if this shows up on an exam you need to be sure to show all of your steps for the integration and the application of the uh, boundary conditions now then we oh we would jump now to our Excel sheet. These are the data that came that we saw in the slide. 
and we are essentially well not just essentially we are going to insert a scatter plot and there we have our chlorine residual right click on that guy and add a trend line we don't want a linear trend line because we know that this was an exponential decay type equation so let's just put the display or the equation and the r squared value and let's just go ahead and bump this up to like, I don't know, 16.5. Oh, that's pretty big. Nice and huge here. And we can see that y equals 1.09 e to the negative something x was our equation. Well, this is c equals c naught e to the negative kdt um, because t is on the x-axis and c is on the y-axis. So now I can take this directly from Excel, uh, 0 0.061 is KD, and that's what we have back over here. So KD is 0 0.061 hours to the negative one. It's hours because that's what our data were in. They were in hours. Um, so C equals C naught E to the negative KDT. We do a little rearrangement just from algebra because in this case we're solving for C naught. Um, I know that may seem a little confusing, we just said that, wait a minute, C naught, we could get C naught from this, right? Well, this was just the experimental data. And so, yes, in their experiment that they did, C naught was 1.0902. But our goal is to figure out way, much longer down the road here, after 26 hours, um, what's the concentration need to be to begin with to give you a concentration of 0.5 after 26 hours. And for that, we need to plug in um, the 0.5 for C and the 26 hours for T. So it looks like this, 0.5 over E to the negative KD times that time. And we're going to solve for this C naught, and the C naught in this case is 2.44 milligrams per liter. So you can imagine the different types of, con of questions you could answer for this. You could solve for time, for example, to get down to a certain decay value. You could solve for the C naught like we did. Or we could solve for the concentration after a given time. So kind of three different things we could play with for these types of problems. So the answer, 2.44 milligrams per liter is the dose of chlorine required to maintain a residual of 0.5 at that most distant customer's tap uh, that was 26 hours away. Choosing a dis disinfectant. This slide is self-explanatory. You can just read it and it tells you the, everything that I would say for this slide. But let's move on to doing the example problem or describing these figures to you. Here we are, figure 10a, talking about primary disinfectants. That is a key term here. What is a primary disinfectant? That's the disinfectant that is actually doing most of your kill. This is the thing you apply sort of first in the plant. Well, sometimes you might apply something even a little earlier, but at some point in your plant, you're gonna have your primary disinfectant. And this diagram will help you decide what's the best one. So we start here. Do you have TOC in your water, total organic carbon? Let's just say no, we don't have organic carbon. Do you have high bromide? No, you don't have high bromide. Well, then all of your options are open. You could use chlorine dioxide, chlorine, ozone, UV, or some interactive disinfectants. And by interactive disinfectants, they essentially mean a couple of the above. Now, this chart, the rest of it, really teaches you about the different pros and cons of different disinfectants. Why? Because you can look at the high bromide, for example. If you have high bromide, you answer yes, and you have all of these options open to you, and the only one that was excluded is this ozone right here. So you still have chlorine dioxide, chlorine UV, and uh, oh wait need bench or pilot study is also mentioned so um, interactive dis disinfectants aren't mentioned or aren't included up here either but it teaches you something about ozone if you have high bromide you don't want to use ozone 
because you get disinfection byproducts of bromate formed from ozone. Um, let's go the other way. What if you do have high TOC? And let's say you don't have high bromide. Well, if that happens, you have a high disinfection byproduct formation potential, high DBPFP. So you can use ozone in that case with biologically active car activated uh, carbon. Um, the key with the ozone or the, or the BAC, the biological filtration after the ozone, is that when ozone reacts with this TOC here, it breaks down the TOC into material that can be easily assimilated by bacteria. And so you have to have something to allow bacteria to eat that material up before it gets into your distribution system. Otherwise, you'll have a bunch of bacterial growth in your dis distribution system. Okay, chlorine dioxide is also something you can use with high TOC. UV also can work with high TOC, though uh, if the TOC has a lot of color, then UV might not work as well. What's missing from here? Well, we're missing good old chlorine. Where did chlorine go? Well, if you have a high total organic carbon concentration, chlorine is not the best because you're going to form a lot of disinfection byproducts like THMs, trihalomethanes, and other materials. Okay, what if you have high bromide? Yes, okay. Well, then you can use chlorine dioxide or UV, and um, your options are much more limited, in other words. Now in figure 10.9, we learn about secondary disinfectants. Secondary disinfectants are the things that you put in the distribution system or you put in the water before sending it to the distribution system to provide disinfection even in the distribution system just in case there are pipe breaks or other material that made it through your plant and that you want to degrade as it goes down the pipes. Now the interesting thing here is that we do discuss chloramine as a disinfectant or, or a secondary disinfectant. And in the previous slide on figure 10.8, it was not included at all. So that's making an assumption that chloramine is not a primary disinfectant. Now, I think in practice, there are a lot of plants that use chlorine as a primary disinfectant, like the Whitty Atkins plant and the Greenville Stovall plant. In fact, all of Greenville County essentially drinks water that was disinfected with chloramine as a primary disinfectant. Um, but here we're focusing on secondary disinfectants, and uh, that's the way the book, or at least these two figures, have separated things out. So we start at the top in this case. Do we have a high assimilable organic carbon load? Well, the easy water is no. Do we have a high disinfection byproduct formation potential? The easy water is, again, no, so let's start there. Then, do we have an extended distribution time? Uh, again, it's easier if we can answer no, so let's look at these. Chlorine, chlorine dioxide, and chloramine, all three of these options. Again, what is missing? Ozone is missing. Ozone really doesn't have, it doesn't last long in the water. It's highly reactive. It reacts away very quickly. It's not a good secondary disinfectant. What about uh, high assimilable organic carbon? Well, you need biological treatment in that case, or you need to do something to remove that assimilable organic carbon. Again, it's uh, organic carbon that's assimil assimilable by bacteria and other microorganisms. You could use granular activated carbon or biologically active filtration to do that. The Anderson drinking water treatment plant, where Clemson gets its water, is going to be using ozone to treat for tastes and odors and they have told the owners of the plant that or the managers of the plant that they're going to have biologically active filters after they install that ozone um, okay then do we have a high disinfection by product formation potential yes you need to do some sort of treatment to reduce the dbpfp um, that could mean removing organic matter. Maybe you do some kind of enhanced coagulation to remove the organic matter. Maybe you do something like, oh, what else could you do to, oh, like a MyX, like a, 
ion exchange resin. We haven't talked a lot about that, but there are these materials that can remove organic matter. And then we go right back to our same list. And then the extended distribution time is the thing we haven't talked about. If you have a high uh, extended distribution time, then chlorine and chloramines are going to be the way to go. And what's missing from this list is the chlorine dioxide. So again, chlorine dioxide, it has a reasonably a reasonable uh, time that it will last in the distribution system but not nearly as long as chlorine and chloramine so those are the ones that you're going to use for a long distribution time this designing disinfection protocol is used once we have decided what disinfectants we will be using we got to figure out what the CT is, figure out the log requirements that the EPA has established, use CT tables published by the EPA to figure out what the dose and contact time should be. And that's what this next example problem is going to do for us. And now we come to the big, long, confusing example problem. The town of Hard Times has selected ozone. That's going to be their primary disinfectant, and it'll be dosed at 3 milligrams per liter. pH is 7, the winter temperature is 5, summer temperature is 13. We're supposed to design a disinfection system for hard times, which is pretty ambiguous, I know. We have a few other uh, parameters down here. There, it's using the Verde River. And I'm going to walk you through what this means by design a disinfection system. The Verde River has these constituents. It has a reasonable, reasonably high TOC, a bit of bromide in it too. Uh, turbidity, uh, re relatively high maybe. Total coliforms, maybe kind of high. It's a pretty nasty water in general. Even the AOC and the DBP formation potential are rated as high. Oh, here's what we mean by design the system. We've got to figure out what the log removal is, is going to be required, what the log removal achieved due to filtration process. Hmm, and i got to explain even what that means. And then what's this additional CT required to meet the long-term two enhanced surface water treatment rule? Hmm, what does all this mean? I don't know. And then contact chamber design. This is the most straightforward part once we know the things above there. Table 1010 is where we start and I'm going to toggle back and forth a little bit. In fact, what I have done is put in Excel something that you could write just as easily on your paper, but it's going to be easier for me to show it to you in Excel. I have Giardia, viruses, and crypto. These are kind of our controlling factors. Notice E. coli isn't even on there because E. coli is relatively, or fecal coliforms, they're pretty easy to knock out. Um, a lot of times it's Giardia, viruses, or crypto that are going to be the things that we have to worry about the most. Now, the regulations stipulate that you need to remove these things with a certain log removal and it really depends well that's what's in the tables it depends on the regulations we'll see that the treatment credit treatment credit what does this mean well this is what table 1010 is telling us about standard log removal credits for treatment it turns out that if you have treatment if you have sedimentation, coagulation, if you have a conventional filtration plant, in other words, with a coagulation, flocculation, sedimentation, and then granular media filtration, then the EPA will give you credit for that. They will say that, hey, that system can remove 2.5 log of Giardia, 2 log of viruses, and 3 log of crypto. If you have a direct filtration plant and you don't have, this, have the sedimentation, then you don't get as much credit. You only get two log for GRD assist, one log for viruses, and 2.5 log for crypto. Those are lower than the conventional filtration plant, which should make sense. You know, one less unit process, a little bit less treatment. So let's see what we can plug in to our table here. Um, Giardia, the treatment credit. Oh, wait, what did we have? Did we have a conventional treatment plant? Let's go take a look here. 
Oh, 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 we have ozone. Water is treated by conventional coagulation, sedimentation, and filtration. Okay, so we have a conventional filtration plant. GRD is going to be 2.5, viruses 2, and crypto 3. So let's go put that in. 2.5 log for Giardia, 2 for viruses, and 3 for cryptosporidium. Did I get that right? Giardia was 2.5? Okay, Giardia is 2.5. Good. Now, what else do we have in our book? What other things can we learn? How about table 10.5? The recommended overall disinfection as a function of raw water quality. And we got to look at this caveat down here. Overall disinfection includes removal credits for treatment as well as inactivation by disinfectants. So this is this is definitely a, a bit confusing, or maybe when we use the next one, it'll be more confusing. But overall disinfection, in other words, is this. It's the total log removal um, recommended, uh, or or that you need to remove. So from table 10.5, we saw 4 for Giardia and 5 for viruses. Let's go look at that again. Um, all right, so the raw water concentration, microorganisms per 100 liter, is what determined those numbers that I just looked at. So let's bump back up. What do we have for Giardia first? Giardia, we did a study, and this is what you would have to do if you're making a brand new treatment plan. you got to test your water and study it and see. In this case, we had five Giardia cysts for every 100 milliliters of water. So that means we are between the 1 and 10 cysts per 100 milliliters. So for Giardia, we get four log um, recommended overall disinfection. And there we go. There's our four log removal required. So it says recommended overall. Well, to be honest, they're going to require it of you. So that's the total required. Now, what about viruses? Viruses, we had two viruses per 100 milliliters of water. And so if you have, uh, uh, this is less than one. So we're still in the middle here. Five log is going to be required for your overall disinfection and there's the five log now one bad thing about table of 10 5 is they didn't include crypto we're gonna to have to get that in a little bit here in fact table 10 4 is where we can see uh, cryptosporidium now table 10 4 is the additional cryptosporidium log inactivation required for filter water and in our case we had cryptosporidium greater than three per liter. Again, a pretty nasty water that we have going on here. And if you have greater than three uh, osis per liter, then the additional treatment requirement is going to be 2.5 log treatment. Now, let's look at this caveat. Additional treatment requirements reflect a cryptosporidium removal credit of three log for conventional slow sand or diatomaceous earth and a 2.5 log for direct filtration. Uh, in other words, like, th well, it's hard to explain exactly, but we're going to put that 2.5 log over here. This is the log removal required of the disinfectant. And it's this column that they call additional, the additional disinfectant required after the treatment. And when you add up the additional plus the treatment, then you get the total. And so we're going to put 5.5 right here as the total for cryptosporidium. Um, so I realized we did it two different ways for these different things just because the tables gave us different information. But basically what we're doing is trying to fill in this table using or you fill in this table using the data that we have from these tables or the recommendations that, that we have. All right, so now we can fill in the rest of the table. We just take this guy and do that minus that. Of course, I hope you could do it in your head too. Five minus two is three. Oh, definitely. All right, so 1.53 and 2.5. Now, we have to figure out what CT is required. 
And there was, there probably are equations out there, but the regulations are written to where you don't use an equation necessarily, but you use tables. And I am going to upload for you these CT tables. Now, CT table D13 is the first one we're going to use. Let's pop up D13. D13 is the CT for treatment. Oh, I can't zoom in on this guy for some reason here. Hmm. Let me zoom in the old-fashioned way. CT values for three log and activation of Giardia cysts. Well, that's a little bit funny because uh, we need 1.5 log. Uh, our disinfectant has to apply, give us 1.5 log. We don't have anything, uh, I guess I should close this previous example problem here, right? Oh uh, yeah, don't say that way. All right, so table three log and activation. Um, ozone is what we're using. Our temperature was, uh, what was our temperature? It was like uh, 10 degrees C, five degrees C. I think it was five degrees C in the winter and that's really what's going to control our system here. Remember, cold takes longer than hot, so let's design for the cold, and uh, then we know the hot, it'll, the disinfectant will work in the hot weather even better than it does in the cold weather. So let's just plug in our 1.9 into our other table here. 1.9 is the CT required. Now again, that's going to give us three log in activation of GRD assist. We only need 1.5, but that's all we have from this table is that 1.9 will work. So let's go with that for now and I'll talk, we'll talk about it later. What about viruses? Well, for viruses, we'll look at table D14. So let's take a look here. CT and activation for viruses, D14. And we have a similar situation. Four log and activation of viruses is achieved with ozone at a 1.2 CT value. Now there's a CT in minutes per uh, minutes milligram per liter, 1.2. So let's go ahead and put that in our table as well, 1.2. And then now let's go look at cryptosporidium. And I know that cryptosporidium is in table D11. If you were doing this on your own, you might have to look through these things to find the right table. But table D11 tells us that, oh, this one is more robust of a table. We can look at the water temperature and then we can find the actual log in activation. And wouldn't it be nice if all CT tables had this level of detail? Well, the log in activation we need is 2.5. So the CT required for a five degree water temperature and 2.5 log in activation is 40. Oh, 40, 40. So we plug that in. And what do we see here? We see that 40 is far and away above 1.2 and 1.9. So in other words, we're gonna have to apply a lot of disinfectant to kill crypto. And it's gonna take care of the Giardia and the viruses, no problem, because we know we get a lot more log in activation um, with the, with that dose for those compounds. Okay, so we're going to use this 40 milligrams per liter, and the last thing we have to do is figure out what our contact chamber design is. We were told in the problem statement that we were going to use 3 milligram per liter of ozone. The contact time that we just figured out is 40 milligram per liter per minute. Now that, or I'm sorry, the CT value is, is 40 milligram per liter per minute. So you can just look at the units here and see if um, I take my dose, uh, or if I take this guy, milligram per liter per minute, and divide it by the three, oops, sorry, equals this, divided by three, then the contact time is going to be 13.33333 minutes. And um, that is actually the T10 value. The T10 value. So the actual like hydraulic retention time is going to be something like 
T10 divided by 0 0.65 or 20.5 minutes. And that's just because we're assuming, we we're told in the, exam, in the uh, problem statement that we want to assume that our T10 compared to our T0 is 0.65. In other words, we have a lot of short circuiting in this system. And so 20.5 is the retention time or the theoretical retention time, hydraulic retention time that we're going to use to achieve the log removals shown in the previous chart. Table 10.9. Don't be confused by it. It's really the same information as Table 10.5 and 10.4. Notice that we didn't use it. Just a little funky way the chapter is organized, or maybe just for this particular example, we didn't really need it. In our big example problem, we already used CT tables. Where did we get those? We actually downloaded them from the book's website, and you could do that too. Except they're they're posted to black oh posted to Canvas for you. Um, that's probably the best option. You could also get CT tables through the EPA website. Probably harder to find the right tables, so you can just use the ones I gave you. But in the real world, you're probably going to want to check the CT tables and see if there's any updates. And maybe there's some better ones out there that you could use that the EPA has with more data. So what do you need to know from this chapter? The reactions for dissolution of chlorine gas in water and dissociation of HOCl, recognizing, for example, that low pH gives you high HOCl concentrations and higher pH gives you high hypochlorite concentrations. That, that's definitely important. And knowing that Cl2 reacts quickly in in uh, water to give you HOCl, etc. Relative ex advantages and disadvantages of common disinfectants. So you should know, for example, that uh, ozone is more reactive than chlorine, but has a lower residual. You should know that chloramine has a higher residual than chlorine. You should know that chlorine dioxide is somewhere in the middle, those sorts of things. Factors that affect disinfection, things like the temperature going down makes things slow down. Higher time gives you better disinfection, higher concentration, these kinds of concepts. Kinetics of bacterial inactivation, that first order decay, the N over N naught equation that we saw. And I'm going to add in here the first order decay of chlorine too. So knowing that chlorine will be removed over time as it reacts away and that you can figure out that KD, which is the decay reaction rate for chlorine. And you should be able to do that integration to come up with the C equals C naught e to the negative KDT equation. And then you should know the CT method, which is what we spent that big example problem doing. And as sort of an reiteration of the last slide, you need to be able to describe the physical and chemical phenomena that underline disinfection systems. Yeah, kind of the same concentration, time, temperature, kill, etc. that we just talked about. And then design disinfection as used in environmental engineering. Well, that's really that CT concept. And maybe talking about T10 would be another key concept there. And understanding that T10 is going to be shorter than your theoretical detention time and knowing that you need to design your basin accordingly. Okay, that wraps up disinfection.